Eric, do you like your Sunday school class? Do I like my Sunday school class? Absolutely. I feel like it's a perfect fit for who I am and where I'm at with God. I feel like I can really excel in this group. I tried other classes at church, but I don't know, they just weren't really for me. It's, it's hard to get out of bed and drive all the way down to church if you're not getting anything out of the class in the first place. But this one, it just really gels with my personal learning style. I feel like Mrs. Evans gets it, you know, she really understands how to teach to me. And I think she's pretty impressed with my Bible knowledge too. You can tell me who built the ark. Noah? Was it Noah? Yes, it was Noah. <laughs> I knew it. Where were you guys at? <laughs> I know what people say, but no, it's not just the snacks and the songs that make it a better Sunday school class. I just, I, I feel like I really connect with the other students here too. So who do you like better, Spider-Man or Batman? Spider-Man. I just got the new Spider-Man shoes the other day. They're really fast. And Mrs. Evans, she just makes the word come alive with all those big pictures and take home papers. And yeah, she just really brings it down to my level. <laughs> Jesus, it was Jesus. Jesus said that. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, of course Sunday school is important. As long as it's not too difficult and you feel comfortable in it. I mean, I've been in Mrs. Evans' Sunday school class 15 years now. I'm not going anywhere. I'm so I'm my my Yo, teach! I get another one of these? Recognize the danger of that video. Uh, many of you adults, I got juice boxes and snacks in the children's area? I'm done. Um... This, this thing called the Christian life is something that we, we grow in. We don't settle in. Uh, we don't hide in. We grow in. And God always has some big next steps for us. And we can't get so comfortable and so, so sedate, so stuck that we stop moving forward in it. In the uh, Bible, we learn the, really the main job Jesus left for us to do is to make disciples. And, and that means that we're... We're going to, there's going to be a difference between a believer and a disciple. There is no such thing as an instant disciple. Uh, discipline is a key word in this. And so that's where we're going to focus some of our thoughts today on the process of being, living out, becoming a full disciple. Uh, he's an odd bird, but uh, Yakov Smirnoff has somehow made a lot of money in the United States of America. As a, uh, I'm a Russian comedian is his bit. And uh, one of his early, first, one of the first things I ever heard him talk about, he said, when he moved to America, he was so fascinated by how everything in America is so instant. He said, y you, you go and uh, go to the store and there's powdered milk and you add water to your milk. Instantly, you got milk. You go, to, you go to powdered orange juice and you take the powder and you put water in it and instantly you have orange juice. He said, what really amazed him is when he walked down the aisle and it said baby powder. He said, man, what a country. Okay. You just catch up whenever you're ready. Uh, Going to come... Boy, that was, his, that was like doing the wave with you guys. I really enjoyed that. Like the, the, like the kids didn't wake you up enough. Uh, yeah. Some people think that's how discipleship works. It's, it's just a whole thing of, hey, they believe, and just add a little baptism water, and you got a fully developed follower of Jesus Christ, and it all just comes ready-made, and everything's good to go. Not so. It takes a lot more than water to make a disciple. Paul, in, and this is one of the most helpful things, and I'm going to circle back to this multiple times, but Paul in Philippians 2, now we're going to be in Galatians 5 for most of our time today, but Philippians 2 helps in this disciple-making process. He's talking to believers in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. He says, 
Work out your salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So it's this cooperative effort that God's working in us, and we're working some things out. Now, he does not say uh, we are working to earn our salvation because we are saved only one way, and that's by grace through faith, not by what we do, what Jesus has done. But discipleship, following after Christ, coming to reflect evermore his character, and remember, we're talking about character in this series. Reflect evermore his character. That's a cooperative effort. And so while we're working out, he's working in. And that partnership is how spiritual growth occurs. And you can't do it on your own. Not by your own strength, your effort. You, you can't just try harder. We need God's help. And when you give your life to Christ, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. And you are not on your own. He's working from that moment. He's working to create in you the person, the personality, the character of Christ. So he is working in you while you're working it out. So this whole thing of building godly character, we've been looking at it now for several weeks. Uh, Jimmy's uh, shared last week and several Sundays. I've shared a few of these as well. We've gone back and forth in this series talking about character and that it is a process and it takes some work on our part. There's some work involved. There's effort to be applied. There's, there's a commitment that has to happen on our part to say, I'm going to lean into this. It doesn't happen by accident. I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to start in verse 22, and we're going to back up, and we're going to catch some earlier verses here in a moment. Galatians 5.22, this is a listing of what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, and that's because there's other kinds of fruit that a life can come to display too, and so that's why he hits this one. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And he's pointing back to the verses just before. Now, we spent, uh, we spent a Sunday on each one of those fruit of the Spirit uh, a couple of years ago. And that's really not my focus today. It's more how it grows and what that looks like. And so, but I want to summarize quickly. He said the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is the most God-like quality of all. This is God is love, the Bible says. And remember, this whole thing of spiritual growth and fruit is coming to be on, having on display, flowing out of your life, overflowing everywhere into all your relationships, all your actions, all your choices, a character that reflects Jesus. And love is first because it needs to be first. This love in the Bible is never an emotion. It's not a greeting card thing. Love is something you do. It's always tied to action. When God loves, he does something. And that's how we love. And it is selfless. And it involves sacrifices. And it's unconditional. Joy. And that's, joy is one of uh, God's big little words joy. And it means not, oh look, I have a lot of stuff. I'm enjoying a lot of life's pleasures. I'm enjoying a lot of success. All my circumstances are working out the way I think they ought to work out. Therefore, I have joy. This is joy that is in us regardless of what's going on around us. Peace, a lot in common. It's wholeness and togetherness. It's this inner calmness in your spirit. It's Jesus sleeping in the boat while the boat is in the middle of a storm because he has peace. Do you have peace in the storm? Patience, long-suffering. Uh, and by the way, patience, pa patience is not something that you ever develop by yourself. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more patient. Got it. You know how you become patient? 
you hang out with people who are difficult. And that's how you become patient. You don't become patient in a vacuum. You, how do you develop love? You got to hang out with people who are hard to love. You're with people who are easy to love. You haven't developed any, any spiritual muscle in that. And so that's how these all develop. Patience is a great example of that. Where you endure difficult people with grace and kindness. And that brings us to kindness. It's, it's uh, the way the Bible uses this word kindness. You see it more as something that it's an attitude and inclination of your life toward people. To care about them, to watch out for them. It is a non-critical, forgiving spirit kind of thing. Now, you have kindness closely tied to it as the next one, goodness. And goodness is, uh, is tangible helping others. Goodness is moral excellence that results in how, it, that really impacts how you do all things relationship. With people you know well and people you don't know at all. Faithfulness, trustworthiness, reliability, dependability, follow through. And faithfulness is a constant dependence on God. I cannot do anything without Him. And so I'm going to be faithful to Him. I'm going to be found faithful by Him. Gentleness, sometimes translated as meekness. And it doesn't mean weakness in any way. It means a humble submissiveness to, uh, to others. Not always demanding my own way. Not... Uh, screaming my opinions at everyone who will listen or even the people who don't. But it is uh, a belief in the sovereign goodness of God. It's power under control. And then self-control. It's just that inner discipline strength. And self-control makes a difference in how you display your words, in what you consume, in what you desire, all those things are a part of self-control. Now I want to back up because verse 19 has a different set of things. I'll go back to verse 16 and give you the full context. But these things, if there's a fruit of the Spirit, they're also works of the flesh. And what Paul's done here is he's given us a contrast in chapter 5 between the two. The works of the flesh are done in our own weak, feeble efforts, saved or unsaved. This, these just happen. You don't have to work at them happening. It's like a, the flower bed that goes untended. It grows stuff like crazy. It's just a mess. When, when the Holy Spirit's not in control of your life, directing it, you're not leaning into this. You're not seeking to work out your salvation with fear and trembling while God's working in you. When you, you, when you give up your, your spot in, in that process... Or someone who doesn't belong to Christ at all. Has never made that faith commitment. This is the default direction of a sinful heart. The works of the flesh will show up really on their own. And when these things start showing up. It's a diagnostic at the highest level of your spiritual condition. And here's how it is described. I'm going to back up to verse 16. And then it will lead into that a really dark list. I say then walk by the spirit. And you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. If you don't do this, this is where it's going to go. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what's against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, Hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, uh, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, anything similar. I am writing you about these things as I warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I always enjoy that, that list for one reason. It reminds me of the nightly news on all the different networks that do news all the time. This is the people screaming at each other, throwing fits, uh, the madness of social media. Everybody's yelling at everybody else. If you weren't sure what those were, they're the works of the flesh because they don't reflect Christ. Christ reflects a different world, a different time. Doesn't mean you don't believe things. Doesn't mean you don't take stands. Doesn't mean there is not truth in the world. But it means how it's displayed is going to reflect the character of Christ, not the works of the flesh. 
you don't have to plan and prepare for that ugly list of the works of the flesh. You're going to find yourself leaning into the downhill nature of those. That's just, if left to yourself, if you're not praying through it, thinking through it, Bible reading through it, that's just where the road is going to go. And it comes so quickly, so easily. Because it's a sinful world, and a sin-filled heart will lean into it. The fruit of the Spirit is produced in us by God's own Spirit, and only in the lives of those who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Bible has a lot to say about fruit. In uh, the Old Testament, it's mentioned 106 times. In the New Testament, 70 times uh, fruit is discussed. So this is a great illustration. This is my lovely tree here. I have a pie shell over my office. And I'm planning to have some peach pie here at about noon. Uh, see how that works out. Here's what happens. Believers are called, called to produce spiritual fruit. And there's things that are listed. Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews 13 talks about praise to God as a fruit of a believer's life. Winning the lost of faith in Christ, 1 Corinthians 16, is a fruit of someone who belongs to the Lord. Godly living in general, Colossians 1.10, is a fruit of a life given over to Christ. So you see those kind of tangible fruits, action fruit, but action fruit always comes from attitude fruit, from the fruit of the Spirit. Everything draws from there. Everything drives from that uh, direction. Fruit has to do with character, the outward expression of the working of God's Spirit in the life of a believer. Fair enough? So that's, that's what these things are. Fruit is a manifestation of God's character. It's the harvest of a Christ-dominated life. And you can't, you can't buy this fruit. Like, okay, so here's this. and uh, I, want, I want it to have a peach on it today, but it doesn't. So I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to tie one to it. And that's how that's going to work. Uh, temporary fix, temporary, temporary goal, and nothing eternal taking place. It does not come from there. It comes from within Fruit is the external evidence of an indwelling Christ. Now, I hate to break this to you, but you can't do that. And fortunately, you do not have to do it all by yourself. That's when the Holy Spirit comes to partner with us in this, uh, working in you and the thing that it talks about us doing is abiding. You know, the peaches on this tree one of these days are going to come on these branches. But th the reason these branches can produce anything is because there's a root system down here and there's a trunk system here. These branches, separate from healthy that, aren't ever going to produce, produce anything. And a believer, separated from the things, here's the Bible words for this, abide. Jesus talks about it in John's gospel. Abide. Connected. Remain. You can't leave it and come back and leave it and come back. You remain in Christ. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's how you come to bear fruit. And how do you remain, abide? We've spent lots of weeks on this. Uh, just as reminders, the way you, you stay connected to here, you spend time in the Word of God. You spend time regularly, daily, in an intensive time, and all through the day, in prayer. You spend time obedient to the things God has said. Obedience keeps you abiding. Uh, sharing the gospel keeps you abiding. Being in community with other believers keeps you abiding, remaining, connected to, to the to a healthy root system, to a healthy trunk that results in godly character. And that's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be in Christ. And that's the definition of a believer in, in Paul's way of saying in Christ. Jesus in, uh, in Matthew 7, he talks about good fruit and bad fruit. And he said, 
good fruit comes from good trees and bad fruit comes from bad trees. Now that's really, really simple. Uh, but you might want to take note of it as a di spiritual diagnostic for your life, what that's going to look like. We look at the same tree, has good fruit, new fruit. We can, we, uh, in fact, Jesus said it this way, it's a, it's a bad fruit, bad tree. If we come back to that same tree and it starts producing good fruit, we don't say, well, I'm glad the fruit got its act together. It's a new tree now. Something changed in the tree. That's how this fruit gets developed. And that's what God does. He doesn't just change the fruit on the outside. The, he changes the character, the life, the believer on the inside. That's where the fruit comes from. It's not just, I'm going to try harder to be a good person, try harder to be a religious person, try harder to do more religious things, try harder to do good deeds in the world. It's all wrapped around character. And that's why we keep coming back in this series. To, it's not just the, the, the decorations on the outside of us. Our perceived, uh, who we want people to perceive we are. But who we really are. Our character. When Jesus said we would know a tree by its fruit. He meant that the fruit can be seen and identified. It's no use saying, well, the Holy Spirit's worked in my life. I'm a believer. I just, I'm just not a fruitful believer. I just don't do that. Again, it circles back. It's, if you belong to Jesus Christ, there is going to be fruit. And that fruit is going to start exhibiting itself. And love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It starts showing up. Not, uh, not a secret disciple. But people are able to observe it. Believers can see it. And people who aren't believers see there is something flowing out of your life that's a character that's so different than the rest of the world. Reflecting Jesus, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is all about. Now, there are gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts. Here, here's the thing. Some of us have one and two and three and they're different you don't have the same gifts I do. I don't have the same gift you do. But the fruit, everybody who names the name of Christ, these ought to be showing up in that life. That's why when Paul says these nine things, he says fruit, which is an odd way to refer to a plural number of things. But it's, it's, uh, it works like a cluster of grapes. Except instead of all being grapes on that cluster, you have all these different kinds of fruit. All nine of them start showing up all at once, same time, same place, same life. And they come together or not at all. Now, this is something God's Spirit works in us. The apostle also says we are to walk in the Spirit, not wait on the Spirit. Well, I'm just going to sit here. On my blessed assurance. And just wait for God to zap me with it. And then it will start appearing. But we walk with him. And that means there is effort. And inclination. And action on our part. Cooperating with God. This is not a passive thing. You can sit in Bible studies. And hear sermons for decades and decades. And be as spiritually mature as a three year old. Unless you just get in the game. And then anything God can do becomes possible in a life. All that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because here's what's happening. There's a war going on inside of you according to Paul. The works of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit. And uh, somewhere in here you just have to decide whose team you're going to be on. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you not belong to Jesus? Are you going to live this life? Are you going to live in disobedience to God your whole life? When, when I, was, uh, I was pastoring out in West Texas, lots of cotton farms. Thousands of acres of uh, cotton. And uh, dry land cotton, though. You have thousands of acres, not a whole lot of cotton out there because they plant two rows, skip two rows, plant two rows, skip two rows because the moisture won't support more than that. There was this, there were some of the farms you drive past out in that community. 
And again, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of acres. And there'd be one, there's one, one farmer in particular, you just, you just kind of, you hurt for his cotton plants. Because you look at them and they just look sickly and none of them were uniform and field was covered up in weeds and rows look like uh, he was uh, checking, he, he was te texting while he was farming. Uh, it was awful. And then, and then there was Vernon. Vernon, his farm, there were the straightest rows. No matter how long they were, they never deviated. And there wasn't ever a weed anywhere. And every plant was the exact same size and everything looked healthy. And so when you, when you went by, you didn't say of the first guy, well, that's a sorry bunch of cotton plants right there. You said, I wonder who the farmer is over that field. He's not very good at work. And you see Vernon's field and you say, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful stand of cotton. And... Uh, there's a pretty special farmer taking care of that cotton. When people look at your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the display of the fruit of the Spirit in your life, when, when you're leaning into this and getting it right, they don't just say, what a nice guy. What a swell person. Instead, they say, whoever, whoever that person's answering to, that's pretty glorious Glorious God, they must serve. And they give glory to God. They see the, the vine dresser, who is our Lord. Well, that's the ideal. And uh, just for your future reference, we are not ideal. None of us is as fruitful as we could be, ought to be. None of us perfect trees. None of us have perfect fruit. However... And that makes it hard because you don't have models, right? I mean, you, you, you know people. I know people in my life that I say, man, they're really, boy, they're, they're getting that right. I, I want my character to be more like their Christ-like character in one of those key areas where I'm maybe not doing so well any given day, any given season of my life. I wish I had more of that. But we do have a perfect model in this. What, what would it look like if all nine of those things were all rocking and rolling and running even and big every day? What would that look like? It would look like Jesus. We see it in Him so perfectly, clearly demonstrated. And if we'll, we'll lean into Him, His example, His teaching, is a perfect tree bearing perfect fruit, then uh, it's like the first psalm says, He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. It'd be good to memorize the fruit of the Spirit, to, to nail that one down in your head and heart. Uh, I make it a regular part of my rotation of praying for myself, praying that the fruit of the Spirit would abound in my life because if I'm not asking Him for it and if I'm not setting the table for that to be who I am on any given day, it's probably not going to happen. So could you, could you just work that in? God, today, may it be on display in my life. Love, joy, peace. Run, run the list and start asking God for it every day. Sometimes you may, I found in my experience, I'll lean into one a little more than others because I know that's where my deficits are. Now, every Christian leaning into the fruit of the Spirit, this character of Christ, justified by faith, this is who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do, yet, we review the list. I review this list. And as I do it slowly and prayerfully, I can get discouraged in a hurry. I look and I say, well, this one, I'm not where I used to be. I sure have a long way to go, and I really blew it midweek last week. Or the ones that 
I'm just not getting any traction at all in this particular fruit. I'm still struggling with things I was struggling with 30 years ago. When, when, do I, when do I get to that spot where it's not a struggle anymore in that particular area? Though the Bible tells us here it's always going to be something of a struggle. You feel it and you say, I, why is it that I still get angry at things that I just ought, ought not to be getting hung up on anymore? And why is it I am so brutally impatient with the people who, honestly, they try my patience. But why is it I respond the way I do? Why is that still so hard? And why am I still not nearly as gentle as Jesus? And so Paul's, Paul's illustration here of the fruit of the Spirit helps us. Because we all know what fruit is. And we all know where fruit comes from. The kids, a while ago, they understand a whole lot about how fruit is produced and how a plant produces what it produces and the challenges of it. And so, from the illustration that Paul gives us, I want to give you some things about true for trees, true for the fruit of the Spirit. And this is our outline. Here we go. First thing is that growth is gradual. And it, I really do want it to happen instantly for me. I want it to happen instantly for you, but that's not how much spiritual growth happens. It just does not happen in an instant. It comes hard, and it comes with some difficulty. Uh, ask my friend who's the really good farmer out in West Texas. He's, he's going to be out early. He's going to be there late. He's going to be working on it all day. That's why it looks the way that it does. A fruit tree grows gradually over years. Careful, deliberate cultivation. Uh, we had choices yesterday, Rhonda and I, about what tree we were going to plant in the backyard. We went with a peach tree. Uh, we could have gone with an apple tree, but I've already read this about apple trees. If you get a one-year-old apple tree, well-established, good root system, you plant it in the right climate, fertile soil, you care for it exactly as you should, it's probably going to be five years before you see the first apple hanging from a branch. It's going to be many more years later until it's at full capacity and it's really producing what you want. Well, I would have cut it down long before then. Yeah, a tree has to be tended carefully, pruned deliberately, loved patiently until they bear the best fruit. Our growth in character is going to be gradual. Uh, I want it to be instant. The old, uh, the old illustration. If uh, you, you want to be a spiritual mushroom, you can do it in 24 hours. If you want to be an oak tree, it's going to take you 30 years. Uh, you got to be in for the long haul. And, and you have to lean into this thing of spiritual growth with all your heart and trust that God is, uh, God is faithful. And He's going to produce the fruit. Growth is inevitable where there's life. Now, uh, a healthy tree, and that's the second thing, inevitable. A healthy tree, lovingly tended, will bear fruit. And it is inevitable that somebody who belongs to Jesus Christ, you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You must bear fruit. And this is one of the things. If these things aren't showing up, you're either not leaning into it right or you don't know Jesus. But th these are the things that mark that give evidence of I mean, this thing, if I plant it and all it ever does is that and it never produces a peach, I'm going to say it's not much of a tree and I'm, I, I need more evidence than a bloom that it's a peach tree. When there's a peach hanging on one of those branches, I'll believe it. Then I'll know it's true. And the same is true for a believer. If these, the fruit of the Spirit isn't showing up, th there's a problem somewhere and we need to examine our hearts we're saved by faith, not by fruit, but the fact remains, if you've been saved by faith, there's going to be fruit. Third thing is that growth is internal. Fruit trees grow and produce fruit. When? They're deeply rooted in the soil. They're healthy. They have what they need, moisture, good soil, all those things. When all those things come into play, they'll, uh, they'll bear. It's internal. But fruit will not grow on dead branches attached to a dead trunk with dead roots. It is not the fruit that makes the tree alive, 
but the living tree that produces the fruit. So this outworking of the fruit of the Spirit depends on this internal thing. Not giftedness, because a lot of people who don't even know Christ can do good things, can be good people in a variety pack of ways, but they're not going to touch eternity. Uh, spiritual gifts are a big part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is proof of a deep internal health and grows out of... Uh, and deep internal spiritual health. Growth is symmetrical. Here's what I mean. A healthy tree, this tree, is not, if, if the only spot where it was growing peaches was right here, I'd say there's still something wrong with my tree. It ought to be growing fruit all over that tree, not just on one side of it. A healthy tree is going to grow fruit all over symmetrically. Now, the Christian's growth works the same way. Whenever you look at the fruit of the Spirit, we need to acknowledge that the word fruit, singular, not plural. The fruit is the entire list, not just the individual character traits. So this is one where you can't say, uh, kindness comes fairly easily to me. Patience I have no need for. That's somebody else's thing. Uh, I'm, I'm good at this, don't care about that, don't need that, don't believe in that. That's your thing, not mine. And that's just not how the fruit works. It's, it's all together, inevitably linked that we cannot have one without the others. It's impossible, it's impossible to say, oh, well, I have the love, I just don't have the patience and kindness. Well, see, 1 Corinthians 13 says love is patient and love is kind. And you start seeing these things feed off of one another. That they all interlock, interact. They grow, one strengthens the other. They go hand in hand for this all to work right. You can't have self-control without some God-given joy, regardless of circumstance. And so it's all the fruit on display. And then growth is invisible. This is a frustrating part of uh, many things, but I look at this thing and I really would like a peach pie for lunch. But it's probably not going to happen. I want it to be instant. I want it to happen right now, and I want to see it happening. And uh, you can look at it, but in real time, you're not going to see, I'm not going to see the tree getting bigger in real time. I can, I'm not going to see the fruit getting bigger and bigger, though it does. All those things happen. I'm not going to see it in, in real time. It's going, to be, it's going to be something that I look back and I say, huh, well, that thing only had me by a few inches uh, back in March, but come July, well, it's, it's considerably bigger than it was. It's taken some ground on me. And you start noticing. And here's how, here's how the fruit of the Spirit works. I don't just wake up one day and say, well, I was a jerk yesterday, but today I'm all full of love. I can just feel it. What happens is you get into a circumstance where it's really hard. And, and somebody is really hard in your life. And you realize it hasn't really affected how I respond to them. I'm still doing love, even though... They haven't changed much, but I'm sure respond to them differently. And historically, I can look back and say, I've made progress. Um, when, I, when I was uh, caught in traffic on 75, and I see these people who they know we're supposed to merge, but they're still shooting down the highway, bogging down the whole thing. And, you know, you can roll down your window and holler at them and uh, all those things. Or you can say, this is going to hold me up two extra minutes today. Well, I think I'll listen to the radio. I think I'll catch up on my prayer time. I think I'll listen to my Bible app. Uh, God gave me a little extra time to spend his word today. And I realized, well, something in me shifted. Something is not where it used to be. And that what seems like individ, in, in, invisible growth 
it's, uh, it's moving. And God has done something in me. What I want to challenge you in today is just to lean into it. To, to do the abide part. And again, it just, it's, it's not hard. This branch, I break this off, it's never going to produce anything. No matter how many blooms it has on it today, it's not going to produce anything if I break it off. It has to remain. It has to abide. I've got to be it, walking as close, staying as tight and connected to the Lord as I can every day for the fruit to develop. And so I've spent time in God's word and I have spent time in prayer and I've spent time in community with other believers. And I'm going to be telling people about Jesus. and I'm going to seek to obey in all the different areas of my life where he's called me to obey. And those things keep me connected. And if I'll do that, fruit just starts showing up. It will in me, it will in you. And it's not just about being a good person, doing the right things, checking the right boxes. It all comes back to our character, who we are in Christ. And it's on display every day.